details for, or at least these practicalities are quite clear. Mm -hmm. If of course they're not clear for any of you, you can write it on ACMD and there are other channels that we provided to you. So you, there are uh, Zoom streams that some people are have joined right now. So I guess we can just start with the with the, what we mean with better scientific company. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Richard first. So what's the difference between scientific computer, scientific computing and computer science? Yeah, like, that's... How would you answer that? <laughs> that's a very nice question. Can I show already the, the link that I yeah. that we have there? Let's in go our for page? it. Yeah. So anyway, I think there's a oh. So this first le lesson is something that Enrico started about a year ago, actually a little bit less than a year ago, when we all went to remote work. So in it, he sort of tried to summarize all the different ways to use computers to do your work. So there's a lot of different levels between using laptop and using national supercomputer. So here we've tried to sort of go over this. So this is sort of a bit focused for Alto, but there'll be a breakout room or the other um, meeting for the University of Oslo people. But really almost any university you'd be at would have a lot of these same options. So from what we say here, you go and you figure out what the equivalent at your location is. Yeah. And in this early, in this first 10, 15 minutes, I'm trying to keep it general, especially because mm, I started studying computer science maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And so I went through these basics. But often I see colleagues who come from other fields, from let's say psychology or natural sciences, you know, nobody has ever actually opened a computer in front of them and show the different pieces. So even even though you know you don't need to know what's inside the car to drive a car, it in some cases it might be useful to know if you need to request a special engine, if you need to use a special resource, then it's good to know what they are and why there's different things. So if I try to answer the what is computing or scientific computing that Richard was asking, XKCD has this nice picture <laughs> that this is a machine learning system. The data comes here, you have a huge pile of linear algebra, and then you have some answers. So, you know, if we want to formalize this a little bit better, when we often, you know, do research, we might run an experiment or we simulate some data. And so we end up with some raw data. And what we need to do is to take this raw data, filter it, process it, do some statistic, fit some models with hypotheses that can come from the literature or other hypotheses that you have. And basically all this process box here is where the computing happens. So it's literally, you know, crunching numbers. And then in the different steps, we get, you know, pre-processed files or statistical maps, figures, plots, etc which then will end up in your figures or posters or papers so that you can publish if you want to publish, if you need to publish. So this is kind of, you know, the process in a conceptual way. But now when it goes to the actual, you know, how does it happen? What's, you know, it's, it's not just a black box that some data goes in and some pictures come out. So in my opinion, I still find it useful in 2021 to understand the components, the physical components and also the more kind of software elements mm -hmm. of a computing system. So what you see in this picture here, this is basically like I wrote a computing node, but it can be a laptop. It's also sometimes called a server. But the idea is that there is some hardware. And then on top of it, there's some software running that lets you use the hardware. So even though for some of you, this might be trivial maybe you know this from high school i don't know when you learn about these things but it's still worth going through these little blocks of the hardware so inside a computing machine inside the server inside the computer there are cpus now i don't really expand on the on the terms but you can read them here at the, at the bottom so this is like where the the math happens there's some operation multiplication sums etc yeah and then of course you need some some kind of fast access memory. It's like, you know, that you are doing some mental computation, 
you want to do in your head 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 so you need to store some some of the intermediate numbers somewhere easily to to find and then of course in a computer in a laptop in a server there's also a, a disk where you might want to store files so something a little bit bigger than what you would store in this uh, ram memory and here specifically i wrote ssd which is a type of disk that basically it's everywhere these days it's it's really fast it's it's what you have for example in a usb stick so it's um it's um, it has quite fast access to the to the files but then in some computers and in some servers you might also have a little bit more than cpus you have the gpus which is the graphical processing unit the gpus were initially kind of used for you know processing graphics so that you can uh, generate like beautiful images let's say that you want to play video game with a high frame rate but what it's it's interesting that, that the architecture of the GPU is like many many CPUs layered in parallel so then you can really you know run you, you can use them also for computations for running many you know computations in in parallel and then often this is of course a very simple you know schematic of a hardware of a computing system but there's often a network system that you can because sometimes we need to access the internet you need to download stuff from the internet you need to access data that is more far away so here i wrote a big this kind of big bucket with the idea be that here yeah, this big data it's way too big to be stored in this local hard disk and it might be stored in a remote location even you know far away on the on the planet i guess you could say things are getting a lot more complex like before there was CPU, and now there's CPU and GPU that need to be programmed differently. And yeah. before there was memory, and now there's all these different types of storage that trade off accessing it faster or being larger. Exactly. And, so on. and then on, on, on top of this, you might even have other, other limitations that maybe the data that you need to access is big and it's also sensitive. Then, you know, you, you can't really plug any cloud storage here you might have to to use for example what your university has and this is also just just to remind the the viewers that we have a hackmd so if you are, if you're watching this from the from the link that we provided you go to the bottom and you click to hackmd if any of you has ever opened a computer and built one you can write it down and and tell your <laughs> your experiences so but just just remember that you can ask questions in the akmd and use it interactively all right but um, basically on top of the hardware of course there needs to be some you know software that we can use to interact with the hardware to actually use the hardware so every computing system has an operating system which is a piece of software that can basically you know talk with all the pieces of hardware and make sure that everything works together I guess you're all familiar with this and we don't really need to explain much more than it. And on top of it, you have software applications. So now you, for example, you're running some web browser to watch the stream and you might already, you, you might open, I don't know, MATLAB or R as we wrote here. So another, another distinction that I will also mention later when we talk about the different strategies of doing computing is that some of these applications have a graphical user interface with the idea being that you interact with the application with some buttons with you need, you know, I don't know you press a button to change the size of your font to run an analysis but some other application which we will focus especially on the second part today they use this command line interface now somebody might ask why do we still need to use command line interface in 2021 well if you think of the analogy of the of the of the coffee machine the coffee machine has few buttons and the coffee machine will just do what those you know five buttons do but if you really need to customize because you're a coffee you know expert and you really need to customize some timings of brewing or other things you need to start coding your executable bits of course you could start building your own graphical user interface it's you know it's, if you have all the time in the world you can add more layers on top of this but the first step is to start with the coding so that from the terminal you can launch you can start your executable mm -hmm. yeah. and then we have basically i also mentioned your containers even though we won't really cover them in this course but 
maybe whether you already came across this term or you might come across this term, the idea is that in the container, it's a piece of software, but inside you have you might have graphical user interface, command line, executable, and another operating system. So it's like that you carry a full software stack around and you can run it in multiple in multiple nodes. So now a question that you should ask yourself or a question that comes obvious is like, what do I need to make computing happen? Okay, I have a piece of hardware or, you know, I got access to a HPC, high performance computing cluster. Okay, what do I need to do now? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's not easy to understand what are your needs. It's not easy to know, you know, do I need more RAM? Do I need a better hard disk? Do I need uh, more CPUs? I wrote some questions here. We don't really need to go through all of them, but the typical example is that you get access to a supercomputer, which has, you know, if the normal laptop has four CPUs, supercomputer might, you know, you might have thousands, you have access to thousands of CPUs. But this doesn't mean that you're the software that runs on your laptop automatically sees these thousands of CPUs in the in the supercomputer. It's actually, it could even happen that something that runs on your laptop is actually faster when you when you run it on your laptop rather than on the on the supercomputer which basically means that the code and the software needs to be adapted to use all the resources in the supercomputer. Another example that I often see is, is this GPUs. It would be great if automatically whatever code you, you wrote automatically can see, okay, there's a GPU in this machine. I can use all the power of a, of a GPU. But in practice, it's not like that. GPUs need have their own special language so the software that you have most likely needs to be rewritten or needs to be using library different libraries so that it can run on a gpu so you know i'm it, it's 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 not simple and at the beginning it might even feel frustrating to you know to kind of move from your local laptop that you maybe are used to to a to a remote system that is more more powerful but this is why we're here and this is what we kind of will cover in this uh, in these three days yeah, and this so, is sort of like the biggest barrier, like, you know, you have your own computer and that's easy to use, but, you know, the initial transition of changing to the big computer, like, it's as much an art as a science and, well, it's difficult to teach art. Yeah. So. Yeah. And also, I think that it might take time to understand what are your needs. So at the beginning, you don't know whether you need more memory or faster access to the data or more CPU. So at the beginning, it's a bit of a trial and error. And it's okay. And actually, at least for those at Alto, we are here to help you in this uh, in this process. I think, so, I think as I've been thinking back to things, I learned more from working with people and see how they work than trying to, you know, read a book or read tutorials myself right now. So like I, yeah. I really want va like valuedness sharing knowledge and co-working for things. And it's excellent that you bring up the different way of working because, you know, in, if there is no way, there is not a single answer on how do I do scientific computing. So some people, they use these notebooks. Maybe some of you have used notebooks. Some people are happy with the command line interface that I mentioned earlier. Some people really need to use this high performance computing cluster. Some people use graphical interfaces like uh, MATLAB or RStudio. And some other people, they, they, they just write down the code, you know, with, the, with, with just a TXT editor. So finding your way is also part of this process. It's, all, it's also good, like Richard was saying, to learn a bit from the other. You maybe sit down with somebody who has already been doing it for a while and see how they do it. See if you like that way of working with the data and with computing and then eventually, you know, find your own, your own way. So here, I finally to kind of wrap up this, this bit is, you know, you started doing some computing, maybe with your laptop and you're quite happy, but you start feeling the limitations because your data is too big or your processing needs are growing. So what is next? Where can you go? Where, where can you take your code with you to a more powerful system? So I kind of think 
you know, this is just a personal thought. There might be more categories, but I think that we can kind of have three types of system. So one system is like a remote desktop. The, the idea of the remote desktop is like, you know, some of you might have an office and in this office, you might have a workstation. It's your own dedicated workstation. It's much more powerful than your laptop. So the idea is that you can connect to the workstation. Let's say that it's this one here in this cloud that I'm highlighting with the mouse. And it's your own workstation. There you can run, you know, your powerful whatever scripts. And you, and you know that nobody touches it and it's more powerful than your laptop. Another option is the virtual machine. So we don't really need to explain or even know what is a virtual machine, but the idea is that you can connect, let's say, through a website. One example here is, is my, my, my binder that anyone can use. And there, through the graphical interface, you can basically say, you know what, I need to run a notebook, one of these Jupyter notebook, and I need, you know, some power because I'm planning to run this and this analysis. And so you can get one node, meaning you can get one of these machines for your use until you are basically done with your analysis, and then you can close and and continue with your with your local laptop or with your local desktop. And then maybe the third type of kind of doing computing on remote is the high performance cluster. Where here it's, uh, if you see, I wrote that the first two are a bit interactive in a sense that you connect to a system and you launch things and uh, you know you get some answers and some pictures, etc. With the high performance cluster, it's more like that you have all many, many, many hundreds of these computing nodes waiting for something to do. And here you just send to the queue. So like uh, you, as I wrote here, you submit a computing job. So you tell the queue, I would like to run this command, this script for five days. And when you're done, let me know about it. So then it goes to the queue. And when it's your turn, one of these computers picks up your, your request, executes it. And then after whatever amount of time, you get the answer. So it's not interactive like the previous two workflow. But then here you can really request, you know, because you know that let's say your code needs to run on multiple CPUs. You you can have, I don't know, as many CPUs as you as your code is, needs. So do you have something these, to add, Richard? Yeah, I guess these also sort of go up in the amount of difficulty. Like remote desktop is basically the same as what your laptop does, but you're still limited to basically one computer. And then these other, the second level layer is still interactive, which means it's easy to develop, but you have more power. And then once you get to the cluster, you basically have to write a program to run your other program. And that's what the Linux shell scripting tutorial is about coming up uh, in 40 minutes. Yeah. It's, so, it's a good point that you, that you bring this up also on the, on the levels. There's also a level of uh, kind of sharing a resource with the others that in this remote desktop, it's your machine in your office or wherever it is. And maybe you do what you want there. But the more you go higher here, you are sharing a big resource with many other people. So, you know, you have to respect, you have to somewhat follow the cluster etiquette when you, when you start using these uh, more powerful systems. So here to wrap up at the end of this page that you should all have access to, I listed, I tried to find as many as possible services where you can, you know, click and start running a Jupyter notebook or requesting a terminal and, and doing some machine learning or whatever you need to do. Some of them, of course, as you might expect, especially when you start reading things like Microsoft or Amazon, some of them, they are very limited with what you can do with the free or freemium, whatever they call it. Yeah. But this is why many of the people watching here, they also belong to a university. Meaning that you might have computing resources at your university. And if I really go back to this picture here, this is exactly what is seen, at least in Alto and in, in Norway as well, and in other universities in Finland. So what would you say about the balance between free resources available to everyone and resources at your university? Like when do you recommend people to use the free resources sometimes or to stay within the university or what? 
This is a very a very good point because, for example, I, I had to reply to a to a reviewer when I, when I was when we, when we were doing a scientific paper, and I wanted to show interactively that you know we were right and they were wrong. <laughs> so I sketched I sketched a Jupyter notebook using using Google Colab because I know that they can basically see the same system. They don't need the password of my Alto system in my case. So in in that case, it was. It was really convenient to share with others, with us that I don't even know who they are because peer review is anonymous, you know, a, a little bit of code. But then, you know, often in that's not a simple answer. It's 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 good or it's interesting to know and to get to know this system. Maybe, you know, one day you wanna go and work in a company and maybe they use this Amazon web services and elastic cloud systems. And so it's good to learn and you can play with them for for free, but when it comes to maybe computing power, I would, you know, it's it's much easier to work with your own university and with the system that we have at, at, at university. They care, like our university, they take care of so much practicalities that, you know, if you, if you start running your own Amazon server and Elastic Cloud, you basically also need to start learning about being an admin <laughs> of, a, yeah. of, a, of a server and, you know, so it's... Uh, yeah. Also, there's some point like our university offers some of these cloud services like the Microsoft Azure for free. But the difficulty yeah, of using that, like Enrico said, you basically have to become your own system administrator to use that, which is a few layers removed from typical research. So that's why consulting with the experts at your university to find the right level of difficulty for you is good. So, um, yeah, any other comments here? So we're constantly watching the HackMD. If you scroll to the bottom, you see some questions there. And um, I guess we will, well, the questions are already being answered, but we'll go through and answer some of them on the stream afterwards. So I guess now should we split up into the university specific groups? So if you're at Alta University, you can stay here and we will go over the different specific tools at Alto. So for example, this computer has access to this data, this computer has access to this data, and these are all connected this way. If you are at Oslo, there is a separate Zoom where you'll get a Oslo specific presentation. And then at 45 minutes past the hour, we will finish and begin a general question and answers back here on the stream where we'll go over the questions in HackMD and discuss them a little bit more and then um, also hopefully work a break into there. Yeah, that's really good. So, so maybe yeah. let's... I guess we can begin might... the Alto thing right away and Oslo can start once people get there. Okay. Since Alto's here. So once again, you know, this is a nice page and it's part of our website, psychom.alto.fi. If you're not familiar with this website, I, you know, I don't have anything against alto.fi. Alto.fi is a nice website and you can find solutions on alto.fi. But here we try to make a little bit easier to find a solution that is related to computing. So you can often try to find already a solution in psychom.alto.fi and one solution or one overview of all the computing system at, at Alto is here in this page that I'm using right now. So there is no other page or at least I'm not aware of any other page in, under Alto that kind of gathers all these different types of workflows and all these different ways of doing computing at Alto. But what is nice is that you can edit this page. If you feel that we are missing something, you can submit uh, edit request and we, we can integrate it and you also get a credit, of course. <laughs> credit as in karma, not a, <laughs> not a study credit. So anyway, it's, it, it all goes down what I was already saying. What's your style? Do you rather, do you want to be independent with your laptop, be, you know, your own administrator and decide what to run and what to install and you're happy with that and that's okay? Or do you really, I don't know, you work in a team that they have a huge amount of data and you all need to use the same computing system. 
So that's everything is possible in, in basically in the options that we have at Alto. Do you think so, that there are one or the other? Because I guess also there's sort of like being able to use all of them. Like it's easy to develop code on your own computer and then you can scale up and like run yeah. it on the cluster and then bring it back to your laptop. So I guess portability is also very important somehow. Yeah, it's cool. In the end, I mean, you will find yourself using a bit of all these workflows that we that we mentioned in this page. In general, now this, I'm more going to focus on these remote workflows, meaning that most likely you know how to use your laptop mm. and maybe you know what to install or what you want yeah. to use. And there you are your own boss and you can experiment and prototype and, and, and work with your with your resources. But things get interesting or get more a little bit more complicated when you start sharing the resources with other. Or as I mentioned in some of the workflows in the in the page there, sometimes you might have you might be working with some sensitive data that is that shouldn't leave this Alto network that we see here. So you know you can't take a copy of the data to your own laptop and use it, you should run everything or your, you know, your analysis, at least with the real data should happen in, um, on the, within the Alto network. So if you think of this three system that I mentioned earlier, these remote machines, there are some options that are open for everyone. And I, I think these are actually for everyone, even for, for master student, bachelor students, right, Richard? Like anyone can connect to this. Yeah, exactly. Machines. The shell servers anyone can use. And in fact, I think that's they're basically recommended for students mainly. Yeah, so this is a good starting point. You connect to a remote machine and you can, of course, there will be other people connected. So sometimes you might it might be a struggle to use as many resources that you can. But this is a, a good starting point for everyone to to work with the remote desktop. Some people here, they might belong to a department and they might have access to department workstation. Like I was saying earlier, you know, you have, um, you have an office and you can connect to your workstation. So yeah, this is useful because you know that that's your workstation. No one is going to touch it. Well, sometimes maybe the administrator need to, to reboot it or unplug it. <laughs> but in general, you know, this, th there is a, I, 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 wrote, I drove this picture that, you know, this is like the entry point. So it's another computer, but no computing happens in these computers. This is just a gateway because if you would start running a huge, uh, you know, Python program on this computer, you will start blocking the entrance for all the others. So you enter in the gateway. I wrote now some names here. We have a list of those names in our pages, but uh, Maggie is the one for computer science department. Amor is for MBE. And then once you are in the gateway, then you are in your department network. And then you go to your workstation, if you know the name of the, of the workstation. And when now you go to the works, here, when yeah, no, you go, go to the workstation, do you go by SSH and shell or graphical or how does this connection work? Yeah, this is a good question. I didn't kind of like, there are different ways of accessing this department workstation, the SSH that we will show later, the Richard will show later, it's kind of like the terminal connection so that through the terminal, you first SSH, you first connect to this entry point to the gateway and then you SSH to your machine and then you can run terminal command. But sometimes you can also, or you might want to have a graphical interface. So there is a way to get the graphical interface through this path, but what it's interesting that you can also get a graphical interface to your workstation following this other path that I will demonstrate soon. So, but long, long story short, yes, you can have both a SSH or terminal interface and also the, the graphical if needed. Okay. Thanks. There's a, there's another, there's another channel, which is called SFTP, which is like SSH, but it's for file transfer. So maybe sometimes you might also find yourself to use SF, SFTP. We have a nice page with all these options under psychom.alto.fi, SFTP, rsync, SCP. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't need to explain them now, so, but you might find yourself. Yeah, uh, I guess there's so many different. And yeah. I guess for people listening now, you don't need to worry. Like realize there are all these options and we realize you'll probably need to think for your particular case and ask someone which one you should use. 
Yeah. And we'll go into this a little bit more about our Triton cluster next week in the high performance computing kickstart things. But anyway, and maybe, so. And now actually they were talking about file systems and accessing and transferring files. It's worth mentioning that this is also something that is not transparent to the you know, to people at Alto, that there are actually different storage system and systems managed by different parties. So you have your own kind of home folder, which is this Alto ITS, IT services. And there you have your files, your settings. It's basically when you log in in a, in a, in a workstation, what do you see there? You know, if you yeah. have a workstation, a department workstation or a, or a student and I guess workstation. The yeah. I guess the concept of network file system is something we should talk about too like there's the storage system but the same data is accessible on many different computers like for example no matter which alto computer you're using if it's not a laptop it will have the same home directory so your same personal files there and then you can also do something called mounting and you mount the file system onto your laptop computer and you have access to these files. And this is really great because there's one central storage place which is shareable and backed up and snapshotted and really secure. And you can use the data in all of these different places. And this is yeah, something okay. that's maybe really a non-obvious thing coming from working on your own computer and needing to manually move the file each time you need to. And it's nice that you bring up the laptop because actually if you have a if you have an alto laptop they already kind of have the system so that the home folder in your laptop is synchronized with the workstation so you might be working on your laptop and then go to the department open the workstation and see the same files so it it, it doesn't always you know work perfectly but it's uh, it's I, I can say that it's quite good if especially if you're not dealing with huge really big files but so yeah this kind of uh, how can I call it? Remote desktop or powerful machine workflow. It's quite clear. And um, what is interesting, maybe what many don't know, it's kind of using or accessing the Alto network and computing resources through some other systems. I really like this vdi.alto.fi. I'm going to show it for you if you never used it, because we still have some 10 minutes. So you can visit this vdi.alto.fi. There's also another link here in the, where did it go? in the page there is this mfa vdi.alto.fi the difference is that this mfa these are those rooms where those computer rooms that we have in um, in various buildings at alto so these are actually only windows machines instead in vdi you can i will show you now we can request a linux machine or a, or a windows machine and what is nice is that you know it, it works through the web browser if you want, of course, you can install this VMware client so that you create this remote desktop connection with one virtual machine. Otherwise, you know, you might be visiting your relatives and there's no way that you can install anything there, but only through the web browser and your Alto account. You can log in and then here you have some options. So Ubuntu 18 and Ubuntu 18 in NVIDIA. So these are Linux machines, and specifically this one as a GPU. I would say that if you don't really need the GPU, stick with the with the standard Ubuntu, just because there's more of them, so there's no queue, and then they are they're more stable. And same story for the Windows machine if you need. These are also useful not just for computing. You might need I don't know you might need access to Microsoft Word, and you don't have Microsoft Word in your laptop. You have it there. And then, so I'm gonna click on the Linux one. And now this is exactly, okay, this is something that I left open from, which this is also nice that, that you have things, you know, that I was doing something yesterday and I didn't need to reopen everything. I, I, I already have it there. It stays there for 24 hours. But here, you know, this is exactly what I meant. You can, this is the same view that you would have in a workstation at Alto, in a Linux workstation at Alto. So you can start whatever software you need to write you need to you want to start a matlab or you know something else everything is uh, is uh, possible and this is something open for anyone at alto even beta students can can use this uh, vdi system 
So you can even, while I'm talking and while I'm showing you, you feel free to open a window, go to vdi.alta.fi and, and try it out. Of course, you know, the amount of resources is not infinite. I think there are some hundreds of these virtual machines, but eventually, you That's know, if, a good if, question. I'll ask. Yeah. But uh, so far we never reached, I never, I'm, I'm using it almost daily. I never found a day that I could not get access to a, to a virtual machine. And then to wrap up, there is the Triton cluster or, you know, the more, the less interactive. Uh, it, you can also actually, we, we will show Monday, you can also interact with these nodes, meaning that you can get access to one of these computing nodes and interact live, sending commands and receiving answers. But usually the way we work with this um, uh, high performance computing clusters is to that we basically prepare the code that we need to run, send it to a queue, and then wait not too long and read the answers. Yeah. So let's see what other options are there. Well, we maybe another option is CSC. this. Or let's yeah, see the Jupyter first, yeah. Yeah, maybe just to also to show some of you maybe through your coursework or other work, you might be familiar with these Jupyter notebooks that I also mentioned earlier. If you're not familiar, that's okay, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that you might come across. So Alto and especially Triton, the Triton cluster, we also provide this Jupyter access to the Triton, uh, to the Triton nodes. This basically means that once again, through a web interface, so you don't need to install anything. You can be at your grandparents with their all computer, you just need an internet connection. You go to jupyter.triton.alta.fi and you can basically start computing. You see the files that you would see when you connect to Triton and you can run, I can briefly show it if you. So here you type your username and then wait that it starts so there you are I'm, I'm not gonna start it now because otherwise it, it, it gets the the resources but um here you can pick you know are you gonna need it for 10 hours four hours you know there's some different options yeah, and okay. then when you click it's the it's the same kind of interface that you would if you're familiar with this jupiter yeah and this has all the same data as is available on triton so basically you can use jupyter.triton to develop and debug and so on. And then you switch to the command line and submit a job and then you get, well, all the power you need. This is also a good point about the Triton data. We will cover it also on Monday for those who follow the Triton, but you see that it's kind of independent from this Alto ITS system. So the difference is that the file system that we provide here is huge. It's really huge. I don't remember how many petabytes, maybe two or three. But um, the the other catch is that this is called Scratch. It means that it's not backed up. Yeah, and occasionally we have someone that asks, can you recover data? And say, like, well, no. But actually, I, th I think it's not the, I, th I think it's a good thing that it's not backed up mm -hmm. because the, the idea would be that, you know, your original data, like if I can go back to the, to this uh, schematic that I was showing here, you know, your raw data, you, you should back, you, that should be backup. Or if it's a simulation, you know, those scripts that you were running to, to synthesize the data, those should be backed up and you can ask your IT people, what's the best way, but then whatever comes after you know, you don't want it to back it up because then you know that you back up the process to obtain those files. So you you know that you back up the, the files that you need, the, the, the scripts, the code that you need, but the output, you know, we, you, you don't have to care. You don't have to start remembering, okay, this output, which version was it? Do I, is that the right one that I submitted with the paper? You can just rerun the process, wait some days and, and regenerate everything. And this sort of like talking about the data things is a really interesting or interesting, really important concept, which is the memory hierarchy. So like Enrico said, Scratch is big, but not backed up. So the advantages are if someone says I need 200 terabytes of space for an experiment for a few months, that's nothing. Like 
we can just give that to you but if you but it's not backed up so then you would have the original data on the alto it services storage which we can also provide to you and then that is smaller so if you ask for hundreds of terabytes they'd sort of ask what you're doing and why but it's backed up it's snapshotted it's replicated to some other data center somewhere we don't know so that if the whole campus explodes you can still get that data back the downside is it's smaller and then you go to something like the hard drive on your own computer which well it's not necessarily faster than these things but it's closer and you can use it yourself then you get to the memory on your computer which is the amount of ram you have and then you get to the processor caches and once you get to like really when you're really trying to optimize code and make it run fast all of these considerations matter but i think they also matter from the general data management point of view like the idea of having the secure storage for the original data the scratch storage for the stuff you're working on lately the version control for the code is well it's also yeah, a it's form a very... of memory hierarchy that we need to think yeah. about and these are the if you think back to what i was saying earlier or you know when you start to understand the needs your computational needs then you start to understand okay i have a gpu gpus they are really intensive they want lots of data and really fast maybe you that data then shouldn't live on scratch maybe you need to move the data to the local disk of that node you know but these things we can you know it's a it's a learning that you will you will learn it um, yeah. by, by doing and by using it you know, there's even a RAM file system where it uses the computer's main memory as what looks like a place you can store files, but it's just stored in the computer's memory. So once the computer reboots, then it's gone. And this can be useful for certain kinds of optimization. But maybe we're going a little bit too deep, so we should go back yeah. to the big summary picture. Oh, I was so asking basically... about CSC. Yeah, so in this in that. this page here, we also mentioned that this is what Alto provides. But in Finland, everyone who is affiliated with the research institution, you can also use resources at CSC. CSC has lots of training material, and uh, you know you can follow there. So but um, what is often, CSC? <laughs> I never remember the acronym. Is it? Um, <laughs> Do you yeah, is, <laughs> is it even officially accurate? Is it this Center for Scientific Computing? Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think that's it. I'm looking it up to see. But anyway, I guess we can say it's the Center. Well, Wikipedia says it's called CSC hyphen IT Center for Science. Okay. So well, anyway, no one, everyone just calls it CSC, but it's a government owned, well, government and university owned company which provides resources for science, for education and research. And most of its funding comes from the government, not from the research project. So you can use all of their things basically for free for research yeah. and teaching. And we're actually being no I just wanted to say that we've been actually working with them so that it's not too difficult to export and move your workflow from alto to the csc system so we can share some of the modules that we will mention on monday and other things to make like, your life easier yeah what we're saying yeah so each so maybe we can talk about sort of the general like give a summary now of the general tiers so you start with your laptop and then what would you say is the next higher level? Well, then maybe so, you, it, it's, it's good to then try to move what can run on your laptop on your department workstation or virtual machine VDI. that I show with VDI. Yeah. So that's... Uh, okay. You know. And then and you then, can go a little bit higher to Jupyter Hub, like here. 
So, so then, then you can start getting access to the Triton resources. From a Jupyter notebook, you can submit the jobs, the non-interactive jobs. So it starts to scale in a sense that you can get more, you can get access to more resources mm -hmm. with your with your computational yeah. needs. Here, I also mentioned that you can actually have these interactive graphical or non-graphical sessions with the Triton cluster. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. trick is basically to go through VDI now I still have the VDI open here, so that, um, well, I, I don't know how interesting this is, of course, for everyone, but uh, but the idea is that, that we will show also later today that you can connect to the Triton cluster, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, with this, okay. uh, you, you can save the graphical interface. So we're and coming then basically to the question time. Um, but yeah. okay, so next higher level is, Triton interactively. And the last one is this non interactive. We, we basically what, yeah. what I what I cover in the in the in the picture. This is a long mm -hmm. explanation of pros and cons. In my opinion, if you're starting with, with Triton and with our system, it's it's worth spending the twenty minutes to go through this page and understand what is there. So yeah, let's show you have a look at the HackMD. Is there any question that is highlighted by yeah, so Our now helpers. it's question time. So we have HackMD here, and we'll go through and scroll up and find any interesting questions to answer, and you can continue um, writing down there. If you're in some of the other chats or Zoom meetings, you can also ask there, and then um, someone might relay them to us. Let's see. So, yeah, also don't forget to take a break. So at the next hour in 13 minutes, we start the Linux shell part. So let's try to take a quick break before we get there. Okay. I'm scrolling through the questions to see if there's anything. It yeah. looks to our amazing helper I've already. Yeah. Right. This is interesting. What about the legality of code when using a free online platform? Mm -hmm. This is uh, uh, it. It yeah. always depends. That's the <laughs> that's the simple answer. I would say that platforms do not block any of your code. Nobody checks. But uh, you you might use a code. Somebody in the license of the code of someone else's code that you might use. They might they might add to the license. You know, yeah. you should not run this on Amazon. You know, you can mm -hmm. you can do what you want with your code. So eventually, you know, you need to check the libraries that you're using. Yeah, and I guess especially if you're doing something with innovations and so on, the innovation office would say, don't use free services that, because then that's basically releasing it, so that affects your ability to patent it or commercialize it. Yeah, this is a very good point. What I mentioned earlier that you can have sensitive data and store it in Alto system. The sensitivity is also for the code. You might have sensitive code because you're planning to patent or because it is sensitive that maybe does something, you know, mm -hmm. important. Then then it's better that it stays in the Alto network and on the Alto system. You don't want to carry it yeah. around. Right. And mm -hmm. Yes, some question about VDI. Well, but for the previous question, I guess if you like if it's sort of general science stuff and you talk to your supervisor and say, yeah, like I'm using this in Colab to collaborate with people, that's a pretty much like, you know, if, if you talk to your supervisor and say, we're doing this, I think many people do that and it's probably okay. Just make sure that there's yeah. no particular reason to keep it secret because basically you're releasing it to, well, your university security office would say that you're releasing it publicly, even though it's not really public. There's not security control there. Yeah. So I don't look that everyone got the yeah. answer. Some questions are specific to some of the systems yeah. that people are already using. It's, it's great that we're already actually familiar with this system. 
the number of VDI machines with NVIDIA is limited. Yeah, yes, that's that's true. I'm trying not to use them because I, you know, I, I don't basically do any GPU computing unless I'm just testing someone somebody's errors. But in general, yeah, the you know, it's not the. If you need to run more GPU computing, then maybe Triton has more more resources for for those. And of course, there's also this um, this um, classroom workstations. In uh, our documentation, if you search there, if you search there for Paniki, this is auto specific, I know, but um, in Paniki you have access. I hope mm, my finish yeah. is correct. You also have access to other GPUs. I guess we should have said that also, so that Paniki classroom. So sometimes students ask us, okay, we'd like to use GPUs for a project. So, so like VDI, well, Triton is what has most of the GPUs at Alto, but that is for research only. So um, the Paniki is a physical computer lab, but you can also connect to it via SSH. And when you connect there, then you can use the GPUs for general student projects. And connecting there via SSH, well, that uses Linux shell, which is what comes up next. Yeah. And this Mari, Mari computer is actually what I mentioned earlier, this, um, what was the name? I never yeah. remember. This other, other VDI option, this, um, mm -hmm. so those are, yeah, MFA.VDI, yeah. those are the Mari. Yeah. The Mari computers. So the Paniki computers are not only for computer science students. Yeah. Anyone can use it. Well, everyone at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good point. OK, I think maybe it's good to stretch our legs and yeah. especially for the viewers. Should we? But you can keep on writing on the AKMD. We keep an eye on it then yeah should right. we say that we are back at the sharp 13 yeah, sharp i guess basically sharp so see you then <laughs>